at the time to the end, so you'll get your full hour, which I think we're going to need. Um, talking here about immigration and future cities with a very esteemed panel. Um, we have uh, each speaker is going to just go for five minutes maximum at the beginning to set out the stall and we'll have a bit of discussion. First speaker is going to be Sundar Katwala, second to my right here, who was formerly General Secretary of the Fabian Society from, for eight years, which is a long time. He's been a leader writer at the Observer, research director at Foreign Policy Centre, and is now director of British Future, which does a lot of uh, think tanky and research work into areas around this. To my right is Namada Firanagama, and she uh, came to the UK as a child refugee from Sri Lanka at the age of 11, has been the TUC's National Policy Officer for Women, and now works for Unison's Policy and Public Affairs Unit with a very tiny brief covering merely employment rights, the labour market, further on higher education, migrant workers, and immigration. So she's got an easy job then. Um, at my far right is John Harris, journalist and author, uh, writes regularly for The Guardian, issues around politics, popular culture, and music, author of several books, including So Now Who Do We Vote For? which I think is a very good question, examining the 2005 UK general election and Hail Hail Rock and Roll. And we will also be joined very shortly, we hope, by Thagam Devonair, who is the MP for Bristol West, which she won that constituency in 2015. Actually started out as a professional cellist, you may or may not know. Um, but then our main focus in her working life has been uh, campaigning against domestic violence. And in Parliament, she has chaired the all-party parliamentary group on refugees. So, we're going to just get some um, starting points for all the speakers. Uh, Sunda, could you take us away? Thanks very much, and uh, it's, it's, it's great to be here in Bristol. I'm somebody who thinks immigration's made a really important contribution to this country. There are lots of us here, people like me, who wouldn't be here without it. My dad came here from India when he'd completed his uh, medical studies, came here to work as a doctor. He met my mum, who'd come from Cork in Ireland, uh, to work here as a, as a nurse. So I'm a sort of product of the British Empire, decolonisation, the post-war NHS. So, you know, I'm aware of the contribution to immigration. If, like me, you think immigration's been part of who we are, um, it's obviously worrying if that case is very polarising, seems to be lost, seems to have lost people's confidence, as I'm very interested in the conversations we need to have to rebuild a sense of confidence in what immigration does, how we manage diversity, how we manage integration. So British Future, um, the organisation uh, I run, which has been going for about five years now, is interested in this being a confident, inclusive and welcoming society, but wants to engage mostly with the people who feel anxious rather than confident to find out how we're going to get there, how we're going to get through this kind of moment. Obviously Brexit has thrown all of that up in a very dramatic way. Way. So one of the things we've been doing in the last uh, six months is called the National Conversation on Immigration. This involves going to 60 towns and cities um, in every region of Britain and doing two things, talking to people who've got um, engagement in the issue, there might be local faith groups, there might be local council, there might be trade unionists, businesses, people who are migrants themselves, people who are working on issues of immigration, and holding citizens' panels of broadly representative groups of about a dozen people of the place we're in and actually asking the question, what should we do next? The, you know, we've had a decision that you know, something's gonna change. What should change? What do you want? Do, what don't you want? What are the pressures? What are the gains? How are we gonna handle it? And um, you know, if you do that in 60 places, we've done about 35 of these uh, meetings so far. You know, if you're in North London, if you're in Leicester or Wolverhampton, you've got a lot of a sense of the contribution that immigration has made to a place, but also challenges about integration and segregation today. If you go to the Fenlands, you get a different uh, story about how the pace of change has felt. If you go to the Shetland Islands, as we did as well, so 5% immigrants, the rest of Scotland, then you can find out about, you know, fairy fishermen and uh, Chinese restaurants and what, what's going on there. Big housing shortages in the Shetlands, actually. They'd love people to come and build more houses, but there's nowhere for them to live if people don't come and build houses. Catch-22 situation that's very familiar in a lot of other places. So we're having those conversations. That's feeding into the uh, Home Affairs Select Committee, which is asking the question, can there be common ground on immigration? Is it polarising or not? I think it's an important question to ask now, because I think it is getting more polarised at both ends of the debate, actually. 
it's got more polarised at the sort of UKIP, Nigel Farage, I want my country back end, which, you know, one of the reasons we had the referendum and one of the reasons it tilted that way. Since then, I think it's got more polarised at the sort of Bristol, Cambridge, Oxford, I'd like my country back from the people who wanted their country back. <laughs> <laughs> end of the debate. And, uh, you know, we do talk to ourselves in this debate. And we're, I'm just quite interested in, in how we get a conversation going across that divide as well as within those bits of the divide. Clearly, it's good to have a, a welcome refugees movement as well as a sort of UKIP mobilisation. But I think the last election was about the country getting more polarised by did you go to university or not? How old are you? How young are you? Do you live in a city? Do you live outside a city? So I'm very interested in how we get across that divide. Um, you know, in terms of what we found in different places we go, you, you get a lot of similar conversations everywhere about there being gains from immigration when people come and work for the NHS uh, or you know um, do jobs that need doing but there's a lot of a lot of worry about the pressure on public services that seems much more important than uh, jobs and wage levels actually it's pressures on housing and health services that people talk about everywhere pressures on wages come up in particular places for particular reasons I think the biggest thing that comes across is your experience of integration really 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 matters as to whether you think we should carry on having immigration or whether you really think we need to sort of rethink what we're doing. And oh, your experience of integration is what you're watching on the news and what's going on nationally. But it's very, very influenced by how you feel it's going on in the city, town or place uh, you know best. I think people who've got personal contact uh, in their family history, in the workplace, at the school gate, with people who've come here, just talk very differently about the issues that people people who don't, but then there are a lot of people who've got, who will make a big distinction between their loss of confidence and their complete loss of trust now in governments and how governments have handled that, and a big distinction to what that means for the people they know at the school gate who've come from Poland and what they think, you know, almost universally in these conversations, you have conversations in very tough places like Merthyr Tidville, the Fenlands and so on, very, very few people don't think Europeans who are here should stay, they just think that's a value about who we are as a country when we're going through a change, but they are making quite a big distinction between people who've come to you know, work hard, bring up their family and do the right thing, and the government, in their view, not having a clue, not having a grip, not knowing what was going on. So I think the starting point is we've lost confidence in how we handle immigration and integration in this country. There are some people who want big changes because of Brexit, because of that. I think if you're someone who wants us to be, knows we'll be a country of immigration and diversity, it's more important that we get into why have we lost confidence and what do we do about that. So hopefully we hope to bring back some ideas about, about what, what really works. But we know that, you know, we know that contact really matters. We know that government or politicians or other people paying attention to your local experience really matters as well as having things to say about the levels of numbers nationally. Um, but I think the thing that's worried us most is um, a lot of mixed views. I think most people are balancers about immigration. There's very, very low trust in politicians of any kind. Good and, time for me to arrive. <laughs> and certainly that trust could, that, you know, people see Brexit as a moment that could bring about change and we could rethink it. There could be less trust in three or four years' time as a result of Brexit and not more trust. Thanks and uh, welcome, Fanny. Um, each... Perhaps we'll touch upon issues around, practical issues around migrant workers, public services, some of those kind of real issues that are going to confront the country very soon. The debate is going to move Thank from rhetoric to reality very quickly. But actually talk more, starting off, about this conversation about immigration. Because I'm often asked, why can't we just tell people that migrant workers make a real contribution, they take, you know, they, they put a lot in. And I think that, you know, it doesn't often work, this kind of myth busting, because I don't think that's the real subtext of the conversation that's really happening. I don't think that many, many people talk about control. They mean managed migration, point space systems, or targets. I think it's about the unsettling changes happening in our lives and to the world. And that anxiety deepens when people lose confidence in politics to manage resources or to ensure fairness or to anchor us in a safe place um, as we head into a very uncertain uh, future. And what better place to hang these questions on when there's a vacuum than on the precise point where the world meets us, and that's our borders. So, and I understand that because you know who else understands the anxiety of change and impermanence? That's migrant people, and in particular refugees. People who, have to, uh, people who flee because of either war or poverty, 
And after coming to the UK, I learned that you don't have to live through a war or flee for your life to be anxious about the future. And it's the one thing that's allowed me to empathize with every different kind of person I've met in this country um, during my time here. And when I first came here, I used to fondly think that my knowledge of English history and literature and my ability to quote poetry is what would like, allow me to integrate here. <laughs> Just sadly, yeah. disabused of within one day in secondary school, I had to go to the library and read all the back copies of smash hits <laughs> instead. <laughs> but, so, but, I mean, but it was, a, you know, I, I really feel that the source of these divisions are also a place where common ground can be found. We can all feel as if we aren't listened to. We can all feel that politics should work better, be fairer, be more equitable. We all want to feel a bit more important and to feel like we belong somewhere. And this is something all healthy democracies have to engage with constantly. It's always part of the challenge, and that's exactly what's in our hands now, um, the <coughs> political situation we're in. And this is familiar to trade unions as well. Fair places. Fair workplaces actually take a lot of work. They don't happen by accident. Shared identities work best when they're inclusive and they are created through negotiation and compromise, not just waiting around for everyone to be nice. Um, and every exploitative, unhappy workplace I've ever come across has shared one characteristic. No one talks to each other, people are isolated, they don't relate to each other as human beings or as workers who have some solidarity with each other. And that applies whether if they all came, live in the same town, shared a completely uh, shared identity, and are related to each other even. Um, it's amazing how quickly that changes if conversations happen again, which is why I think you know, uh, this work you're doing Sunday is so important. We all need that solidarity within our, um, and that, uh, we all need the solidarity now within our local communities, our workplaces, and across the UK. I think that time is more needed now than ever. And if net migration falls within a year to tens of thousands of workers, leaving aside the economic impact from growth to tax receipts and so on, employers won't suddenly start paying indigenous workers more. You only have to listen to some parts of the Tory party to understand that's not going to happen. Nothing's ever been given to working class people in this country without a struggle. And nothing has ever made us stronger than fighting together. And as any trade union rep knows, this doesn't happen naturally without hard work, without some conflict and some forged understandings. So I don't think, we, you know, if we don't do this work on a constant basis, uh, we can't then sit back and think, well, why isn't democracy working? Why doesn't, you know, why aren't people engaged in politics? People don't, aren't engaged in politics, but they just passively watch it. It only ever feels like something when people are engaged in it, um, uh, in their workplace, in their community, nationally. And because we have to live with people who disagree with us, we have to find a way to do this and still see each other as worthwhile and important. And I think that's where the problem of democracy, and that's where the strength of democracy is, not just the divisions. And I have some experience of this because I grew up in a country where the rise of competing murderous nationalisms tore my com community apart. And I had a Sinhalese father and a Tamil mother who got married secretly in a friend's home while race riots raged outside. And in the end, what I learned from this experience is that nationalism, the most extremist kinds, doesn't kill the purported enemy, but its own best shining hopes. And that's what you have to worry about now. Um, it was my Sinhalese father who was imprisoned without trial by the Sinhalese government for years and hunted by racist Sinhalese paramilitaries when he was released. And it was my Tamil mother, a scientist, academic, and feminist, who returned to the war zone to be with the Tamil people, which is welcome news of many people who advocate people going back and giving their best to their country, um, who was assassinated by the Tamil Tigers. Neither of them were attacked because they married the enemy. Neither of them were attacked because they weren't contributing to their own community. Both of them were denounced as traitors because they truly served the community that the nationalists were trying to represent. So I think there's some very clear understandings we have to go into in this debate. There are people who say they are speaking for people, and then there are people who have to try and work for them. And in the times ahead, I think it's very clear who those people are going to be. And um, our, our members in unison, migrants and indigenous who work in public services, serving everyone in the community, clearly have their um, um, uh, priorities set. So I'll end by saying that I can tell you from the heart that the only alternative to what I've experienced is messy democracy, uncomfortable conversations, 
a willingness to disagree, and being compassionate and open to all. It is too easy to let go of our principles when they are unpopular, difficult, or the times are hard. But that's exactly when we need to live and exemplify their uncomfortable truth. Thanks very much. time working for The Guardian making a, a video series, an ongoing video series called Anywhere But Westminster. I've been doing it for seven years. So there's not many places we haven't been making that series. Uh, and we talk to people on the street and in their workplaces and wherever we find them. And usually the conversations don't start with who you're going to vote for or what do you think about Brexit or any of that. That's what the BBC would do. It's why Vox Pops on the six o'clock news are always useless because they have a camera the size of a house and they're wearing a suit and they run up to someone and say, hello, how are you going to vote? And they look scared out of their wits, and I would as well. We have a sort of small camera, we don't wear suits. Uh, we went to state school, which helps. And, um, and we say to people, what's it like living here? And how do you feel about the future? And eventually that then sort of blurs over into a conversation about whatever is happening, an election or a referendum or whatever democratic carnival we're having that year. We seem to have them sort of once every six months at the moment. Um, and I'm very worried, really, about where we are, particularly in the light of what I've seen maybe in the last six months or a year. It's a very, very strange phase of our national history, this, in the sense that something is happening and yet it's not happening. We all know Brexit is upon us and, you know, it's going to reach a watershed point very, very soon, but the sort of direct nitty-gritty experience of that hasn't really happened yet. Everybody still talks about it in the abstract. Um, but I do know that um, this is a very divided, polarised country, more than it was seven or eight years ago, clearly. And I'm worried, really, about where Brexit has taken us, both in terms of that polarisation and division and public attitudes, but I'm also very worried about basic questions about the economy, chiefly in the context of the vital contribution that people who've come to Britain from overseas make to the economy. Um, now, you don't need me to tell you that there is clearly a, a division, broadly speaking, between people who live in cities and people who don't live in cities. It's slightly complicated by divisions, attitudinal divisions within cities. So in Manchester, for example, if you're in the middle of town or in one of the more affluent parts of Manchester, like Didsbury, which is like Clifton, only not nearly as posh. Um, if you go from there to Collyhurst, so which is the, the first bit of North Manchester you hit, it's about 20 minutes walk outside town, you're really in a different universe. Collyhurst is 90% white. Uh, there's no supermarket there. Cash point charge is 185 for withdrawals. There's no kids' playground. Uh, everybody I met there was voting for Brexit, right? Whereas in the more affluent parts of Manchester, a very short walk away, things are almost turned on their heads. And there are divisions within Brexit places as well. So last year, uh, I went to Sleaford in Lincolnshire, uh, sort of place you think of as a Brexit heartland. Older people there were militantly pro-Brexit. There's a refrain I hear a lot now, which is, why isn't it happened already? Why aren't we out? So I've got a lot of that. But then if you meet anyone under 30 there, they talk about things like migration as if that's just kind of the way the world is, as far as they're concerned. They don't talk about it in any great passion, but they don't think it's problematic. And if you ask them about things like patriotism and nationalism, they don't actually know what you're talking about. So that's kind of what it's like there. Um, but on the whole, notwithstanding those nuances, I think that city, non-city divide is real and deep. Um, and at the same time, against that sort of background, Despite the fact that we haven't actually left the European Union, and no one has a clue how we do that, clearly, uh, at least of all the people that are supposed to be negotiating this, changes are already happening. Within this phony war, if you look hard enough, this weird phase of history, things are already happening. Two weeks ago, I was in Kent, the Garden of England. I woke up in Rochester. Uh, I remembered why I was there. And... Um, we went to, uh, it takes a lot of remembering when you're in Rochester, it's a bit of a what am I doing here sort of place. And I, I went to see a, a fruit grower, a soft fruit grower, big farm he's got, and he depends on seasonal workers who come to pick raspberries uh, from uh, Bulgaria and Romania chiefly. Now he, in, in the course of this summer, has already lost 70 tonnes of raspberries because of labour shortages. He lost, he's got these polytunnels that are about 200 yards long. And he lost, in a month, he lost 70 poly polytunnels worth of raspberries because he can't source seasonal workers anymore. He certainly can't source them locally because nobody wants to do it. 
And before anyone thinks he's a venal capitalist pig, if he pays more than the living wage, he just he runs at a loss because he's squeezed by the supermarkets, right? And half the population wouldn't be able to afford the raspberries if the price went up and so on. So he sort of sits in the middle of this very dysfunctional food economy that we've got, but that's how he makes his living. Now, down the road in Gillingham, I met a lot of people who were sort of intransigent about Brexit. And if you ask them, well, who's going to pick the fruit then? They don't want to talk about it. What they say is, you're a Remainer, aren't you? Right? They sniff it on you, and they're actually quite hostile. Uh, presumably they know what The Guardian is, which didn't help, but uh, that's a cross I always have to bear. Um, <laughs> now, I then, I then the day after that, it was a kind of long trip, went to a sausage factory in Yorkshire where they pay the workers their £9 an hour. Right? Now, I don't, wouldn't want to work in a sausage factory for 10 minutes, but God bless these people. If you, if you eat heck sausages that are like hipster sausages, probably big in Bristol, um, <laughs> they're the people who make them. Now, they too are in the midst of labour shortages. They'd like to have more workers working there than they've got, and they are really worried about the future. I then went to Manchester, and I met an Italian nurse in Manchester, who's from Puglia, one of the poorest parts of Italy. She's, I'd never heard a hybrid Mancunian Italian accent before, she's got one. And um, she said that she has friends in Italy who had recently planned to come here to work as nurses, but had decided not to because of Brexit. And she also said that in the course of her working life, post-referendum, there's, there's a sort of scenario which has now started to happen. Now, her English is brilliant, right? She has a Mancunian accent. But now, every now and again, someone will say to her, an indigenous so-called white British person, will say to her, I don't understand what you're saying. Right? Now, that's clearly nonsense. But they feel somehow they have a license to say that. And as far as she's concerned, and this applies to other of her colleagues, they're sort of saying, I don't want to be treated by a nurse who wasn't born and raised where I was. She said that's something she started to notice. Now, in the midst of all this, it seems to me, we need to acknowledge uh, one thing. There's a sort of conversation about these three million people from the EU in this country and their contribution and what's going to happen to them. And you hear ministers from the government talking about which system they're going to invent. You know, should we renew the seasonal workers scheme or have a registration system? These sort of nuanced conversations about how on earth we're going to, post-Brexit, we're going to maintain the contribution of some of these people. If that's what the ministers want, sometimes it's unclear. In my opinion, that's a necessary conversation, but in terms of the signal we've already sent out to the world, it doesn't matter. If you talk to people from Latvia or Lithuania or Bulgaria and Romania, as far as a lot of them are concerned, there is now a big neon sign over this country and it says, we don't want any foreigners here, right? And of course, like all of us, they're all on Facebook and all the rest of it, and this is the nature of the conversation that people have now. And it seems to me that if you go to a place like Gillingham, you get the sense that that is precisely the way that a significant number of people in this country want it. They do want a neon sign over this country saying we don't want foreigners here. Now, um, culturally, that's clearly catastrophic. Economically, that will be catastrophic as well. You think about who's going to work in care homes in the context of an aging population, the food economy I mentioned earlier, who's going to drive the buses. I, I mean, these are all cliches, but only because they're true. And the economically catastrophic aspect of that as much as it hits anyone, will hit people who voted for Brexit. And it's too easy to say, well, things couldn't get any worse in Merthyr Tidville, so what's the problem? Things can get worse in Merthyr Tidville, things can get worse in Stoke-on-Trent, and they probably will. Now, this is a conversation I think we need to have. During the referendum, if I drank four pints of lager, I would start to feel slightly ambivalent about Brexit, and I would think, well, that kind of is a case for leaving because of what's happened to Greece and all that. I don't really feel that anymore. I know the EU is a deeply imperfect institution in all sorts of ways. It strikes me as quite an odd scenario when it seems it's impossible to leave something. I mean, what, what kind of institution is that? But you know what? I don't like the idea of living in a cave and eating grass. So I'm quite happy to kind of stay put and I'm anxious about what's going to happen if we don't or when we don't. I think there's a need for political leadership in the midst of all this and I don't blame Thangham for this at all, but I think there's a problem here with the Labour Party. Oh, yes, there is. Uh, which, as far as I can tell, is led by people who are very comfortable with Brexit. Yes who actively want it, some of those people, and they don't really want to speak out about these things. Certain Labour Party people are terrified of their own core vote, at so-called core vote, terrified of it, and therefore won't talk about these issues of migrants' contribution, the economic catastrophe we're facing, and all the rest of it. There are people with whom I'm very, very frustrated now, Sadiq Khan, perhaps, you know, there are people who could be more vocal about this and talk about what a dire set of circumstances we're facing who aren't doing. Now, I, I think what's going to happen on balance is that Brexit's going to happen. I can see the argument that it's politically unavoidable that, it's, that it has to happen, because personally I don't believe in referendums at all. I think they're awful, awful things, but we've had one. 
this idea, you know, we can't, we have to respect the will of the people, otherwise Nigel Farage will return and all that stuff. I also have a theory, and, I, you know, we'll all suffer for this, but if we're going to lose this notion that we can survive without the contribution of people from overseas and we can be a sort of sealed off siege economy and all the rest of it, maybe we'll have to learn the hard way. Maybe Brexit is something we'll have to endure for 20 or 30 years and then even people like Nigel Farage and certainly the people who voted for him in the past will realise this is actually untenable. The problem with it is in the interim a lot of us, will, including Nigel Farage, will we'll be living in caves and eating grass. And in the midst of all that, what I find really, really, really worrying, it would be nice to think that we'll sit in the middle of all this economic rubble and say, what a terrible idea. Let's unanimously resolve to rejoin the EU and heal the, this divide between Leavers and Remainers. I think the polarisation and division is actually going to get worse. I'm here to really cheer you up. I think the polarisation and division is likely to get even worse. That's what tends to happen in times of economic catastrophe. You know, the left liberal side of politics doesn't tend to do well in times of economic catastrophe. The nasty hateful side of politics tends to do very well particularly in the absence of that kind of leadership. So um, I'll say this really, um, within all that, there may be a chance that we can re-establish in the midst of the calamity of Brexit, that kind of open and engaged plural vision of the country that we ought to be. And that I would argue, with exceptions, we sort of were in the recent past. We were certainly moving in that direction. But it will require a political form and a political voice and I think that's really, really missing at the moment. We're not going to get it from the Lib Dems, bless them, because no one's listening to them. We're certainly not going to get it from the Conservative Party, and I think there's a big question hanging over the Labour Party, and I think this is a huge, huge problem. Thank you for listening. To a group of us Labour MPs in a very small room in Portcullis House a few days after the referendum, and I felt just as cheerful then as I do feel now, so thanks, John. Uh, but actually, I am by nature an optimist, uh, even in times of great turmoil. And I think that's one of the reasons why I genuinely do feel cheerful. I wasn't being that sarcastic. I took John's words then, as I do now, as really helpful information, because they are. They are. Um, I want to be really clear, uh, in Bristol people tend to think Bristol voted Remain, actually I want to just clear something up, it was mostly Bristol West. You're in the middle of Bristol West at the moment, it's a stupid name because it covers the whole of the centre of town. It goes from Clifton, where by the way we do have some council flats, all the way over to Barton Hill which is mostly <coughs> council flats. But it is an incredibly divided constituency um, by economic status, but on Remain we were nearly united. I actually live in, I believe it is the third most remaining ward in the country, which is Ashley, where over nine out of ten people voted Remain. And most of my constituents, so I don't have to feel scared of my constituents when I say that I know and I believe and I have good evidence for the fact that Brexit is a complete and utter disaster, as much if not more for the people who voted Leave as for those who voted Remain. But I do also understand why a lot of people voted Leave. I'm not going to argue with them about why they voted leave. My problem was the people who kind of opened the door and said, look, jump over that cliff. Um, because they probably won't be harmed at all. I don't think Nigel Farage is going to suffer in any way, shape or form. So when we were asked how might immigration change after Brexit, I put some questions next to it. So for whom? For refugees? For the people from the EU27 who are here, the three million, uh, for the people uh, from the UK who live in the EU27, I have some skin in that game, my husband lives and works in Amsterdam. And so there's a whole load of questions about who's, who's it going to be better or worse for. Personally, at the moment, on my gloomy side, I think it may well be worse for all of those groups, because even though refugees, technically it shouldn't affect refugees, actually it will, because the Dublin Agreement, which is about family reunion, that will be jumped out of the air. I met with the Immigration Minister this week to try and discuss it with him, and he said, don't put any sort of refugee amendments down to the Immigration Bill, it's not about refugees, it's about immigration. I said, oh, don't know where to start with what he just said, um, but he says he wants to keep refugees and immigration separate, and, and I say that if we are to be believe, if we are to believe, or some of us have been told that the referendum result was all about immigration, and that's questionable because it wasn't on the ballot paper, but if we're to believe that, my understanding is that some people did get immigration and refugee immigration and immigration generally mixed up, and other people had no idea <coughs> how the laws on immigration work, nor did they have any idea about the proportions and numbers of refugees or migrants generally. Now, again, I don't want to sit here and call Leave voters stupid because they're not. I do think that it's important that we uh, bring into the debate some light as well as some heat, and occasionally there's a lot of heat and precious little light. Um, so it's, there are, at the moment, 65 point, well, in 2015, there were 65.3 million 
globally, 65.3 million refugees. That's a lot of people. That's one in one, every 113 people. That's the size of quite a well-sized population of a country. Uh, it'll be even more now because in the last few months, nearly half a million, actually over half a million now, Rohingya refugees have arrived over the border into Bangladesh. And that tells us a story. Most refugees do not come to Britain. Only 0.24% of the British population, about a town about the size of Rochdale, that's how many refugees, asylum seekers and people who are displaced, that's how many we have in the United Kingdom. So even if we are pulling up the drawbridge, we're pulling up the drawbridge having taken really pitifully few people in the first place. Now there's an argument about whether or not we're better off helping refugees in country or on the border countries or bringing more refugees here. But Brexit does make it harder, I believe, for us to do the right thing by virtue of the fact what we have effectively <coughs> done or we're in danger of doing is pulling up all drawbridges, putting up more walls rather than breaking them down. So I fear for the refugees that I fight for and fight with. Um, I fear uh, for us as a country. Now, uh, again, I, I vowed to serve my country when I took the vow as an, as an MP and I went into politics because I thought that Parliament should look more like the country that I feel I live in, but increasingly I now feel more and more alienated from that very country um, when I hear things um, from people who say, why haven't we left already? Uh, which includes um, you know, people I know, friends of mine. So you know, not, every, not every person in Bristol West, not every person in my social acquaintance is a Remain voter. I know plenty of Leave voters, but what worries me is that none of them can tell me who this is going to benefit. And they certainly shy away from a conversation about what immigration is going to look like. So what are the risks? I think some of the risks are, I mean, the catastrophes that others have already spoken about, particularly John, um, but I think uh, one of the risks, and I think I can own up to this because I've been pretty open about how I feel about it, is the Lexiteers as well as the Brexiteers, because that weakens the voice um, on the left or the centre-left. And, and I think that's a problem because at the last general election, Brexit was kind of the dog that didn't bark. If you take this constituency for a start, I was standing against another candidate, a former MP, a former government minister with actually arguably a good constituency record, who was representing a party that staked all of its general election uh, ground on Brexit, on fighting Brexit. And I was representing a party, for all I voted against Article 50, and I got a load of kudos for that, I was still representing a party led by someone who has spent his entire political life trying to get us out of the European Union because he believes in socialism in one country. Now, that strikes me as really odd because what do Bristol West do? Those of you who are here, thank you for those of you who voted for me, but actually, you voted for someone whose party is led by someone who wants us out of the EU, and you put in fourth place someone who said he wants to give us a second referendum. Now, I, don't, don't get me wrong, I still think I'm a better MP than Stephen Williams, but it is a problem, because we've now got a narrative in my party, which is we will respect the referendum, and those of us, and I'm going to have to take my jacket off now because I'm about to get an anxiety hot flush as I mention this, those of us in the Parliamentary Labour Party who dare to say this is not a done deal and it's a bad idea and we need to hold a mirror up to what's going on, we are criticised for various things, which include not, represent, not respecting the referendum, but also, we're still undermining our leader. And that, at the moment, is a really problematic place for the centre-left to be. Uh, because I'm not doing this for anything to do with Jeremy. I'm speaking out about Brexit because I believe it's what the people of Bristol West want me to do. I know it's what's best for the country. And it's also what was my party's policy on Europe a few minutes ago. So I think that immigration... Um, is, is the dog that also isn't barking at the moment in public discourse. We're not talking about it. I think that's one of the reasons that Brexiteers, Lexiteers and Remainers have less trust than ever about in politicians. Because we aren't finding those ways of speaking clearly, plainly and honestly about what we really feel about immigration. I'm, I'm the daughter of an immigrant. My dad came over here on a boat on a one-way ticket. His parents sold everything they had to try and give him a better life and for his children to have better lives. And, and, and that came true. But he also would not recognise the world around him now. Um, and, and, and I really don't. I, I worry about it. So my conclusion is that I think if you don't trust politicians, and by the way, I don't think there's ever been a golden age where people trusted politicians. If anyone can tell me when that was, please see me after the talk. Um, but if you don't trust politicians, good. I think at the moment you shouldn't. I think you should be challenging us really, really hard. I think you should be challenging people at all levels. 
And I think if you voted Labour in the last general election because you, you believed that we were the party to, to stop Brexit, you need to tell the leaders of our party that. And if you think that you vote, if you voted Liberal Democrat because you wanted a second referendum, even though there aren't that many Liberal Democrats, there are more than there were, and it's worth telling them that. Nick Clegg, bless him, says join the Labour Party or the Tory Party if you want to stop Brexit. But if you care about immigration, it's now more than ever is the time to be speaking out about it because it could be too late in ten years' time. I fear where we're going. I fear it hugely. Sorry to end on a bum note. Thank you. Very say that um, you know there is a danger that you're saying, well, I understand it, but really it's about something else. I hear what you're saying about immigration, therefore we agree on jobs and housing, don't we? And there's sort of a rush to change yeah. the subject yeah. back to the comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. And to some extent as well, and uh, uh, Mars mentioned this, you know, you're going around saying, but you think they take jobs and wages and look, read the study again. And uh, actually, the things that people are worried about, people are more worried about things in places where it's where it's more real, and the things they're worried about are real. For example, housing pressure. Half of the housing pressure in this country comes from the impacts of immigration, half of it doesn't. So you can say, well, it's only half the housing pressure. What are you worried about? <laughs> People think, well, it is half the housing yeah. pressure then. So if you, if you drop the ball on housing, you'll be in trouble. But actually, questions like, does the government manage well the decisions about who comes into this country or not, who gets a passport, who gets to be us and the way our cities and towns work, which are fundamentally, are we good at managing immigration or not? If that's going badly in your country, everyone in France thinks that's going terribly in their country. In Britain, it's gone quite well in the long term, but we feel to have, we seem to have like lost our confidence with the pace of change and dealing with it. And it's going much, much better or worse in Leicester or Sheffield or the place that you're actually walking past every day. That matters loads. So instead of saying, I feel your pain, but you're probably worried about something else, actually yeah. say, these are real issues. And, you know, someone could offer you less immigration and not changing it. You could do more about the issues, including managing immigration and integration well, so I think, I think there are real issues um, there that are not sort of anxieties that are misplaced. You know, man? Um, yeah, I think that um, when we in Unison talk to our members, and our members are like the rest of the public, there's a real diversity of opinion, we have plenty of leavers, we have plenty of people who want to cut immigration. Um, there are times when we say we disagree with you, and we have a conversation despite the disagreement, that's fine. Our members agree, uh, expect not to agree with us all the time. And actually, we understand that because you go into a workplace, there's plenty of contentious issues like who's going to do jobs, <coughs> redundancy. That's much more contentious and difficult to manage than an abstract question about who's going to come into your community and much more real to someone's life. But there's a, you know, there's a certain percentage of the population who just doesn't like, um, so, you know, they want their, um, their where they live to stay the same, and any kind of change is difficult, and they just don't like it. And the funny thing is, I spent lots of time in very segregated parts of the UK, and the most, the interesting thing is, the people who, who genuinely just didn't like it at all, and were really resistant, and made it very obvious to me, the moment I came in, onto the, into the room, or the workplace, or whatever, were the quickest to change their minds, because the reality of it was so different from their fear, in a way, that they were the easiest people to, um, to win over. Much more difficult, but much subtler and more things that you know, uh, anyone would find in other places, like you know, um, um, assumptions, and especially around gender and so on. That's far more um, rigid and difficult to change in the long term. So I have a complicated reaction to, yes, there are real anxieties. Can they change? Yes, because human beings are by their nature um, complicated. Mm -hmm. And I've never found that to be not the case um, in my time in the UK. But they, you know, um, and I think the, one of the most complicated reactions people have is to refugees, actually. We are really unpopular. We are the most unpopular group of immigrants. Um, and I've thought about this often. And, uh, when I was a child, I used to get attacked in the street a lot more. And now when I look like I'm not a refugee or poor, I don't. And that, for me, that was a very interesting observation. I think it's something about vulnerability. You see someone who's lost everything, and it's scary. You're a very scary person. And the more vulnerable you are, the more scary you are. And that's what makes me think about anxiety when I think about this. Because it's not something theoretical. I, I saw it in people's eyes. I'm like, why do I scare you? I'm, I'm, a, I'm so unthreatening. The more unthreatening I was. I, because people wanted to think I'd done something to lose everything. And they didn't want it to happen to them. And that's something I understand, actually. You know, and in that moment, I felt nothing but understand, you know, compassion for them. Because I'm like, I get it. <laughs> it's scary. You know, it's not good. Having this happen to you. One other issue you want to just raise before we go to the audience, please be ready with your 
uh, questions. Is, is, uh, now there's, there's a thing called the public space where we get a chance to discuss this stuff, right? I mean, that's why question time, for all its awfulness, that's why that's on television, right? Now, I don't think that increasingly exists in any meaningful form. That's certainly what's happened in the States. There isn't much common space. Because this is what Mark Zuckerberg and his wonderful inventions are, are, are doing to the world, right? So I get up in the morning and switch on my phone, and most of the people that I'm aware of are other left-wing people, right? And, uh, and there'll be right-wing journalists at the same place then. But not just that. Let's take it out of the media. If you go to a place like um, Boston in Lincolnshire, like most places, that town runs on Facebook, right? So if you sit in Cosmo Coffee in Boston, or Whist Beach in Cambridgeshire, uh, during a lunch hour, everyone's on Facebook, right? And they have their own filter bubbles that they sit within and so on. So this idea of the messiness of democracy and some opportunity to, to thrash things out and say, look, I feel differently about immigration, how about this? I worry that they don't exist in anything like the way that they did 15 or 20 years ago. And that's, that's what's feeding this polarisation. I mean, you know, people don't necessarily want to be divided. Brexit didn't, Brexit didn't come along and make them divided. There are much deeper tectonic things at work here. And they're about how we feel about ourselves and our place in the world and how we communicate with each other, and that's becoming problematic. I mean, but before I don't know if anyone else comes, comes in, but I mean, that's a good analysis of the problem. Now, in terms of overcoming it, I mean, various of the speakers have talked about the need for, you know, for conversations and for opening up and everything. And you know, is, is, is this just a bit too optimistic, though? The fact that we know if you actually put people in the room and you get them to meet other people and all that kind of stuff, they end up, at the end of the session, hugging each other and changing their minds. But um, do we actually have... To, how do we, in practice, do this nationwide? How can we really get those conversation encounters going, if that is indeed important? Or actually, is it, is it not important? In, in volunteers in the Bristol West Labour Party do, we do that every weekend, three times a weekend, across the whole constituency. And my, a lot of my colleagues do that. So that's not scientific, but it is a way of having, this phrase conversation is a bit overused, I think, but they are genuinely conversations. If you're saying, tell me how you feel, a bit like what John's been saying about his going around the country, that's what I tend to do over a weekend, is say to people in, in BS7 or BS2, tell me how things are going for you, tell me what's on your mind, tell me what's worrying you, let's talk about that. But that's very imperfect, it's not enough. And I don't know yet how we create those bigger com bigger debates. I personally would like to see a return to great big public debates, even if we have to have a forum to do them in, but I don't yet know how we do that. And I think we are at a, at a, at a time of incredible change. So maybe this anxiety about change that we're going through at the moment, because I think we are all having it, whichever side of the debate we're on, will produce some new ways of doing it, but we're going to have to deal with a lot of uncomfortableness. Do you want to say anything to talk about? Just, um, yeah, I mean, one helpful thing that happened the day after the referendum was there's a massive redistribution of anxiety and pessimism mm -hmm. across the country <laughs> to the centres of the places that felt most confident. So, actually, at that particular moment, that was a chance of empathy. It wasn't redistribution, because we're, we're, yeah. we're just all bricking it. No, no, well, to, yeah, hang on. It wasn't like yeah. I, I, was, I was less, yeah. they were less worried and I was suddenly well, worried. There was, there, there, was, there, was, there was a sense that, actually, there was a sense of powerfulness in the brief moment among people who believe, and there was massive shock in the concert. Now, I don't think really confident places like Cambridge Bristol actually have got the have got the sort of stamina to just stay angry for 40 years until they turn it round. And so, in a way, where I think it goes too far, where it doesn't have that, well, we all feel it's anxious. Fact, what we're going to do for it? I think some of the language about living in caves and eating grass actually is quite because no one's changed their mind. I think this social media thing's really real, yeah. But actually, if you talk to the school gate, it's very different. My father-in-law is very much a kind of why haven't we left? Let, um, I don't know, but actually at the school gate, people are like, well, I'll tune back in. You're just all squabbling about it. I'll tune back in when something's actually happening. Yeah. And actually, half the country has never been in this kind of pick a tribe. Half of the country made up their mind about how to vote in the last four weeks. And out there, people are basically thinking, actually, you've got to talk to us now. Actually, and like when we're having these conversations, people actually say, this is a really good idea we're having this conversation. But part of like the Liberal tribe is saying, that's great, yeah, we're talking about more. When are we going to stop it? Because I hate the conversation. We've got to stop it again. And so actually having the confidence to get through the discomfort. There are lots of things, actually, that a lot of people agree on, because the, the basically the 48 and the 52 don't exist. We're split into four quarters. There's a sort of quarter that is the 48%, a quarter that is the 52. The sort of eight, 8 million voters on both sides have got loads in common with each other, and nothing at all in common with the social media warriors who are sort of, who are absolutely committed to always having that revenue, and they're quite fed up about it. So I think 
I think it'll be difficult. We've got to lean into that, that actually people do want to try and work out how we're going to get on yeah. with it. Brief open that about other two questions. Um, I'm always optimistic. Uh, I was optimistic even in the midst of the war in Sri Lanka because um, you actually saw people just be so courageous. Absolutely the most courageous people I ever saw were in the middle of absolutely nothing. No ways to communicate with anyone else. And even if you said anything out loud, that was it. Your life was in danger. And people took enormous political risks just to show humanity to people they didn't know or disagreed with even, even across, in a, across battle um, lines. Um, and I think in this country we have so many resources, we have so much power and we have so many uh, 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 ways to find new solutions for this incomplete or um, uh, debate. And what I've observed in this country so far is po politics doesn't always have to matter. You don't want to live in a country full of heroes, I can tell you that. It's a tragedy that my past is full of heroes. And it's kind of difficult because now we'll have to have a time of people coming to the fore and um, bringing that leadership. And unexpected people will do this um, across the UK. And that is going to be difficult. And I am sad for the UK that you're going to have to experience this. But I'm here to do my part. And I think you'll find that lots of people will emerge now to do it. And I, because of my work, going through, you know, talking to people who work in public services, um, you can't get disheartened when you meet them because you really meet so many brave men, um, people who don't really give up. They have terrible jobs. They get up every day and they're full of hope for what they can do for their families and for themselves and for the country. So I am kind of privileged in the sense I get a very different perspective on this debate as well. Thanks very much. Okay, let's um, open this up. There are, um, there are lots of people in this country who are very hostile to immigration. And uh, I'm a campaigner for the NHS in Bristol, and in all parts of Bristol, we regularly get people coming up to our stores saying the NHS would be fine if we got rid of all the immigrants. Mm. That's just one example of a very common um, a feeling, or one, uh, one example of the hostility that's been shown. What do you think, left of the Labour Party, the Green Party, the Liberal Democrat Party, what do you think? their leaders should be saying to try and address this hostility towards immigration and also in the case of the Labour Party address the fact that despite the fact that the last election it was a lot better result for the Labour Party than many people expected nevertheless the working class vote for the Labour Party declined by number 12 mm. percent yeah. so what what does the panel think left of centre parties, and particularly the Labour Party, what the leadership should be arguing for to try and counter this very strong hostility towards immigration and many Okay, areas. it's because we haven't got much time. I, 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 I suggest that not all panel answer all questions, but I, 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 obviously Fangle's got to answer that because she's an MP, but no, no, you also mentioned this about myth busting not working, yeah. so I, I, perhaps I'd, I'd like to hear what you said about this as well. Well, the, this one is going to be addressed very quickly in the public space because even though the NHS doesn't employ that many EU um, uh, workers, actually it's a social care sector which does, the NHS is running at a deficit of 40,000 um, members of staff. That's 40,000 missing staff. We start losing any small number of EU migrants who just leave because they're tired of waiting for this. The British public is going to understand very quickly the consequences of some of this. And I'm telling you, sometimes real experience changes minds very quickly. And some of those people will pretend they never said those things to you in a year's time. So this is going to get real very fast. Um, thank you. What should the Labour leadership be saying? Uh, <laughs> oh, so many things. Um, I, I want to take the last bit first, though, Sean. You said for the Labour, you point about the Labour working class vote declining. Well, I mean, it did in the 80s as well, and there is... There are, there are political cycles going on. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm taking it um, casually, because I'm definitely not. Um, uh, what I think le leaders should be saying, I think all leaders should be pointing out the huge flaws in, in what the government's plan for Brexit is, i.e. there isn't <coughs> one, and we should be doing that as often as possible. And we shouldn't be having a debate about public sector um, 
things, which we do regularly every week in Parliament at the moment, whenever the Labour Party has an opposition day debate. We debate something to do with either yesterday it was universal credit, next week it's going to be social care. We need to foreground those, top and tail them. We're saying if we leave Brexit with a rubbish deal, and by the way, I think leaving is a rubbish deal, if we leave, but that's what I think, if we leave Brexit with a rubbish deal, there won't be any money to pay for social care or NHS. So we need to be saying that. And I think then that leads naturally onto a discussion, or it should do, ideally, um, a discussion about what immigration contributes to that. And as well as the facts and figures, which don't always go down too well, but they still are necessary. They have to be put out there regularly. And at the moment, I feel like the left-wing leadership is kind of ducking away from that. OK, thanks. So, can I invite both speakers and panels to join and with all this, you reveal a lot of what is going on in other places as well. But uh, I am an immigrant, I live in Bristol, and I'm very happy here, and I admire this country, and I love it. Uh, but um, I, haven't, I haven't been in many places with as many elephants in the rooms uh, as <laughs> the UK. Uh, I, I go around and I see the elephant in the room of race, the elephant in the, in the room of gender, the elephant in the room of class, uh, and uh, discussion that no one wants to talk about, and you know it's very uncomfortable. I myself don't read class as some British have told me that it's possible. I, I, I cannot. I, I can't because of the accent, because of this, because of that. I can't. So my question is, how, how can we, because we have these premises that uh, human are equal, for instance, we all say it, it's difficult to argue it. We, all, we human are equal. However, in, the, in these discussions, in the, in the narratives, we have, we, the UK, are. You know, are. Uh, why don't we change it to the discussion of we all are? You know, we happen to have been born in the UK. Could you come to your final point? Yes, how can we abandon these ideologies of nationalism, so uh, okay. being so important? And, and become, you know, just human beings with administrative Okay, well, it raises the question whether we should. I mean, how, how and should we? I mean, you know, is that the solution? So do you look at this uh, stuff in the world? Should we be just less nationalistic? Or? I mean, that, that, that utopian view, you know, just will have an appeal. But it, 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 it will, you know, it might get somewhere with some people and end up where we all are in 100 years' time. But in the here and now, it isn't how you'll take your role. The issue for future cities, uh, you know, think of the theme of the event, um, is very important. Future cities want to say, but it works here. So we want it here. So it's got, so we're keeping it. And that's, that's, you know, this is us, actually. That might be you, but this is us. We should, we have a voice too. We have our anxieties about what's going to happen. And that's great and fine. And it balances the debate up to a point. As long as the cities don't say, oh, we're the islands. We're now going to be the islands of cosmopolitan uh, confidence. We're going to say to the world, we're still open. Bristol is still open. The University of London is still open. We don't know what the oiks are up to. And actually, the cities, what the cities really should do is say, OK, you've got to spread that sense of economic and cultural change can work for you, which obviously works in Bristol West. You've got to spread it to the rest of the country and the rest of the southwest. But you could start with the rest of Bristol. You could start with the places three, four miles down the road and actually have the places that benefit from it, the businesses, especially I think the universities actually, just being seen to be there because there are places three miles down the road who think that's on a different planet. And it's what, it's what people's aspiration is for their kids if they don't feel their kids will be part of the economic and cultural change. If you can't go three miles across your own city, and make the argument, then you've got no chance of getting across the southwest or across the country. So, in a way, the, the cities have to decide: are we one pole of the debate, or are we going to offer bridges? And if the, if cities and the places of cultural confidence offered bridges, you'd be surprised that more people cross them. Okay. Um, so I want to take, try and take another one. Uh, yeah. um, which is one of the seats the Labour Party lost. Um, but the the. Um, one of the things I found most interesting the first time I went there, and actually most sort of sobering and unsettling, was how much the teaching of English, particularly to Muslim women. There's, there's one part of uh, Walsall, whose name I forget, uh, where the population is, is largely uh, first, second, third generation British Pakistani, I think. And um, you sort of saw what little English provision there was, was kind of emancipation in action. So you had these, uh, these classes of Muslim women who were learning to speak English, uh, and then they would, they would then start participating in the labour force and, you know, engaging with the council and all of this stuff. But they had all their money cut, right, over the last four or five years. And so this was now a sort of very, very threadbare service. I do it for free. Good for you. Um, 
And then the problem was then you had David Cameron at the time, was, the, was he the, no, it was Theresa May. Anyway, um, nonetheless, you had conservative politicians who taught all this stuff about muscular liberalism and everyone's got to subscribe to British values while they're hacking away the very basis of it. And this is one of the gentlemen over there. It's one of your elephants in the room, all this. Now, to, be, to go easy on Jeremy Corbyn for a moment, right? Um, he's sort of half right. I'm, I'm sort of unsatisfied with his stances or lack of them on Brexit. But he's half right in the sense that He's managed, or you know, the Labour Party has, has managed to restore a conversation about some of these elephants in the room, right? And I'm glad that's happened. Because the truth is that although it's misplaced to say to someone who says, I'm concerned about immigration, to be a sort of left-wing person with this residue of Marxism where ultimately it's all about the economy. So you pat them on the head and you say, well, you don't really mean that, as we said already. What you really mean is, right, it's all about hospitals and schools and the economy. I tell you what... We have this conversation about the EU and about migration and Brexit and so on in the most absurd circumstances. And probably in 50 or 60 years we'll look back and acknowledge this. How can you possibly have a conversation about anything in the midst of a housing crisis like we've got in this country? How is that possible? Because inevitably all these resentments are going to define the conversation, right? How can you possibly have a conversation about this after seven years of austerity, right? Where even if you're looking at it in the most benign way, there's been rubbish piling up in the streets, let alone if you're, if you're unfortunate enough to be at the receiving end of social care cuts and all the rest of it. How can you have a conversation about anything when we're seeing the nightmare of, social, of universal credit unfold right now, right? So, ideally what would happen is that those things would be rectified, and then you'd see where we were. And I think there would still be people who are very antipathetic to immigration. I think there'd be less of them, and I think... Uh, the chances of people like me saying, look, it's all right, if we build houses and hospitals, you might not feel so strongly about it, I think that would sound more credible. The absurdity of Brexit is, is given the economically calamitous aspects of that, and I don't, I don't for a minute regret what I said, you know. We might not be living in grass and, in, eating grass and living in caves, but the austerity that's likely to happen is going to be yeah. unimaginable, right? I'm at the receiving end of that. I have a child with special needs, right? I'm terrified about what's going to happen. Now, in the midst of all that, how can you even begin to have a conversation? It strikes me that the conversation about migration, Brexit, the contribution of people from overseas is going to get even more distorted and full of resentment and all the rest of it. And that's why it's not my job. Fortunately, I'm a journalist, right? So I don't have to come up with solutions to anything. It's not my job to sit here and be pessimistic and be optimistic. But I will tell you this. I think the only way you motivate people into action is to, is to remind them and to accentuate precisely the stark circumstances with which they're faced. This is potentially the biggest disaster we've probably ever faced in peacetime. Certainly in the modern era, I'm talking about from sort of 1945 onwards, that's how bad it is. And that's why we need to have a very clear conversation about it in which the people who ostensibly lead us take clear stances. Thanks, so we, we, we are technically over time, so... I just want to pick up slightly where, where John left off uh, and completely avoid answering your question fully because I think it's too, too big. I think integration is a two-way process. Um, one of the things I've done in the last year is um, lead an inquiry in Parliament called Refugees Welcome, question mark, which is about refugee integration, in which we make that argument, say, it's always been conceptualised as something which immigrants should do themselves. You should integrate yourself. My dad tried doing that by speaking absolutely perfect English. He was still very, very obviously Indian, and when he lived in a place where they'd never seen any black people before, it did not help. So just aping the manners of what you think to be British doesn't quite work. And cutting English classes, I know I respect the fact you're doing it for free, but actually we do need paid uh, English classes for people who arrive here. There, are, there aren't enough people, and there are never going to be enough qualified people to go around to do it for free. Um, but I just wanted to, to pick up on the thing about peace, which is the European Union was invented because there were a whole group of people who decided that after the, the appalling slaughter and hatred and nationalism and bigotry of the Second World War and the ideologies of hatred and hating of foreigners, that we should have a different vision, which should be that we should try and live together in peace, that we should try and challenge nationalism. And that, my friends, is what we're walking away from. And actually, I've rethought it. That's what I want to hear the Labour, the leader of the Labour Party say. Thank you. I think it is all about integration in the end. If you're confident about how integration is going in your country, in your city, in your town, then you'll be open to more if we manage it well. And if you think we've dropped the ball entirely, then you're not going to be open to it. So one of the days of Brexit is we'll have some very important debates about where are the care workers coming from, who's going to um, you know, pick the fruit and so on. But it will be a very economic yeah, needs of the economy, needs of the employers, when actually it's fundamentally an identity yeah. issue. So we've got to get the balance right yeah. between those two things. 
what an integration can be a set of things we can agree on, and because we've got better at it, certainly better at them, for it, we're not bad at it in this country in the end. One generation late, we get there. As soon as a new group's arriving, it's like, you know, the Poles are okay actually now, we're worried about the Romanians. And we've got a history of doing that. If you're, yeah. you know, so we don't worry about the Irish. And the Indians, but we've never planned it. It's always been, you know, you'll, you'll find your own ways. We should, we should really focus on integration and what makes it work. And we can agree, you know, now that language is being cut, the left wants to do language and language matters. What is integration? Speaking the same language is absolutely foundational. Speaking the same language in a local accent, that's integration. Your kids, their kids, there are kids. That's how you that's how you get there over generations. So language is really, really important and we can agree to invest in it, I think. Yeah. Um, I live between two different communities, uh, an immigrant community and the rest of the world, and I, I move fairly easily between both of them. And I have one thing I do know, the immigrant community I spend my time with are catching up super fast. Within years of being here, their children are integrated into schools, they're speaking the language of other young people, so even more so than... Uh, but the one thing I have noticed in this country, the absolute rigid, unfixable, unmovable lack of integration is between different classes of people. And it's people, easy for people like me to move into the middle class of this country than it is for some of the working class friends I had at um, um, Sixth Form College and some comprehensive school to change their lives. And they are white. And it's a startling thing that that is another elephant in this room, in this country. The absolute rigid walls that separate people who look the same, have lived here, whose family go back here, and yet there's tiny cues of words, attitude, dress, that define that actually immigrants can move quite easily, more easily between, because we don't have some of the fixed, rigid uh, things pinning us Maybe down. that's why there is a lot of resentment. And I think that links to John, yeah, John's comments about yeah. the other great things that are distorting this conversation. Okay, sorry, not enough time. It wasn't long enough. I no. do apologise.